But now I'm going to kind of go into my argument in a more specific way, just a bit, not very intensely. I don't want to try your patience too much. And as this Trent mentioned, showed you the book. So here it is, Visions of the Buddha, creative dimensions of early Buddhist scripture. So that's the point that to the text, they have this strong creative element within them. They're not trying to, to um, preserve the Buddha's teachings, although in certain cases they may, but that's not like their main um, their main goal, okay? And my, my favorite example is all has been for years, what happens when the Buddha goes to meet a Paribhajaka teacher, this is like a rival renunciate. So he'll wake up very early in the morning and, and after his meditation, he'll see that it's too early to go to town for alms. So then he'll say, why don't I go meet that teacher who's staying in that park? And he heads out there. Now, the thing about these Paribhajikas is that they're, they don't know anything about what, you know, true practice is. You know, you need, to, you need to be the Buddhist student for that, certainly in the Pali world, in the Buddhist world in general. These guys, you know, they sit there and they're talking and they're kind of, they're like animals. They're yelling and they're talking about the army and they're in politics and the king and about thieves and all stuff in the news and about women and gossiping and all this stuff and, and in loud voices and they're chattering and whatever, okay? So then the teacher sees the Buddha, their teacher. There are 500 of them and they're yelling like that. And the Buddha, the, their teacher will see the Buddha coming from afar and he'll say, Shut up, guys, the Buddha's coming. He likes quiet. Maybe if we'll be quiet, he'll think it we're, we're worth, worthy of a visit. So they all kind of manage to somehow calm down. And then the Buddha comes closer and the teacher comes up to greet him and says, welcome, welcome, Swagatam Buddha, Swagatam Bhagava, or no, Bhante, or I don't know how we can remember how he calls him exactly there, but, but it's, it's a term of respect. And he says, and he welcomes in it and says, it's been so long since you visit us. Here, please sit down on this prepared seat, meaning his own seat, the higher seat. And he himself goes and takes a lower seat and sits down to the side, okay? Now this story, call it, repeats in many texts, in about a dozen texts, I think, or, or maybe a bit less, but it's the same formula. It is repeated. And you can take this formula and add another other elements to it. You can have a, one of the Buddhist students or somebody else wanting to come visit the Buddha, figuring out it's too early. And then, the, then this can connect. And that's the point about these formulas is that they're like Lego. You can take them apart and put them back together. And if you take this formula for a meeting with the Paribhajaka, the Buddha will give a teaching about the value of quiet about his capacity for silence, okay? So that, just saying that's a pretty long formula, okay? We could have other formulas, okay? First of all, for other kind of figures, there's a certain way where a Brahmin householder meets the Buddha, he hears of him in a certain way and he goes to him and they wanna go meet, the, they, they wanna go meet the Buddha and they argue between them if they should go meet him or not. And there's all, they're different kind of, Pass that the text can take, but they're specific to Brahmin householders. Just like that formula about the noisy ascetics is particular to meetings with Paribhajikas, and that's the way the texts work with these formulas. Now, these are narrative formulas. They're not just narrative formulas. If we want to see what the Buddhists, who the Buddhists were arguing with, and how they saw the reality or the, the social reality around them, we can take each one of these formulas and take it as a, pic, as a, as a picture of how they, they, what they saw, what they wanted to represent. And in this way, maybe we can get at a certain level of historical reality. But not thinking that when the Buddha went to meet that ascetic teacher or another, that's what exactly happened on that day. Okay. Not only that, we have formulas for doctrine. We have save of jhanas, right? The deep meditative states. They're presented normally in a formulaic way, the same formulas. 
Now, one of the points is that they can be presented in, in, in other ways too. And what happens in the conflicting nature of these accounts, but, or for selflessness or the Four Noble Truths, they each have their formulas. For selflessness, we, we have a bunch of formulas. And hopefully I'll have a, uh, I don't know how I'm doing for time, but um, hopefully I'll have a, a moment to say something about that meditative world towards the end of my talk about the play of formulas in meditation, not only in the creation of the text. So we have formulas for doctrine too. And again, I doubt the Buddha only taught in formulas. Maybe he did impart formulas to his, some of his disciples and they used this as methods for meditation. Maybe this was the way the tradition crystallized his words after time, I, I don't know. I don't know, but again, I think we can take these formulas as kind of crystallized expression of as early a Buddhism as we can look at through the text. And then when we look at the very carefully, these better memorize them, learn them by heart and, and, and recite them. And with time, you kind of maybe pick up on the meaning of what these formulas are about. So the play of formulas means now I'm an author. I got this pool of formulas. I'm going to put my story together in whatever way I feel like it today. Or better, it's not just like how I feel, because I'm probably doing this with another community, with a community of monks, and we feel things together and we have our ideals. But maybe I did bring my own picture of a text to the community, which I got in my meditation or in my walk or somewhere else. Um, and in any case, a text is a combination of formulas. For me, the, the formulas are the real text of early Buddhism. Okay, so the texts are not trying to provide access to historical instances normally. They may at certain times and you know, not, not it's not a kantavada here, not one-sided in any, any way, okay? But they do introduce some of the most important ideals of the early stage of the tradition. Maybe the formulas, they're like key elements in the tradition. And you can see, I'm, I don't think the text is more important than experience or than different contexts. Like maybe, you know, the most important thing on a monk's day would be when he met, a, you know, someone and he gave him alms, or maybe he had a you saw a pretty tree or a bird in the forest, or I don't know what, I'm, I don't think the texts are determining all of experience, but, but they do crystallize very important visions of the tradition. There is a, a, there is a reason why scholars focus on the text. They've overemphasized it. Then we had to give that up a bit, but we got to come back because the texts are the places where the traditions crystallize their vision. So we can see the general worldview through the for, through the formulas. We can see the dynamic. The dynamic is more important than the details. The details are almost chance elements. What, what you put in the right place in the formula, how, how it connects, but the dynamic in which there is this kind of formulaic world, we also live by formulas. I mean, look, Trent introduced me in a certain way. I mean, in, overly generous and I express my thanks. That's the only way you can start a talk like this. It's a formula, okay? That's the way things go. It doesn't mean it's not sincere, right? But when we meet our friends and say, what's up, uh, how you doing and all that, it's all formula. You know, if you answer what's up with some kind of, you know, uh, a deep reflection on existence. So people are like, what's going on with you, man, right? No, you have to kind of say, cool, fine, you know, kind of, so it's because we're, we're formulaic. We, we, we live in the, the, the formulas, they fix these emotional patterns or cognitive patterns. And it's in a sense like, as if like Buddhism is very much aware of this. Working with this dynamic in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a pretty much conscious way, it seems, okay? Okay, this fits, I, I think it's a very Buddhist way of looking at things, by the way. Not like, you know, some core text, an Atman, right? That is, that is permanent and, and then goes, no, but it's always this level of conditionality. 
conditionality, anicca, and then the kind of anicca and an impermanence. Things are coming together, and there's a kind of movement within the tradition. And I think that's that's um, you know part of the Buddhist genius. Okay, I can't see what I said here. Right. So one very important point is that there's not one game within the play of formulas. There are actually different types. In, in my understanding, each Bhanaka tradition, each, each Nikaya, each section of the long or middle or connected or numbered and Guttara discourses is a different game, a different kind of play of formulas. And the book works more with the longer text and the more narrative text, but there are different methods with the Samyutta Nikaya. These are things I'm working on now and writing these very days. Okay, so this is the answer to how the texts were composed. There were different games that I call the play of formulas. And, and, and then, so there's, you know, I guess this is, this is all I can give today at this level is that, you know, there's there are these fixed elements. They can be repeated. They can also be taken apart and moved like the, it's a copy paste method that, that, um, produces more and more texts. Because the idea is not to go back to the Buddha to record, but to explore the possibilities embedded within the Dharma. To investigate the meaning, to, to look deeper, to experience, to give a narrative expression to a deep philosophical principle, to connect a story to a philosophy, and to keep working and creating and understanding life according to Dharma and Dharma according to life. Okay. So I thought it would be appropriate to say where I think this kind of understanding is, is, is taken us. And Trent, I guess we have 10, do I have 10 minutes or should I be absolutely. wrapping? Absolutely. No, no. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Please go for it. Okay, great. 